I'm not a big fan of playing with wolves. However, if I'm going to go into battle, I want a wolf on my side. I don't want a sheep on my side. So that's why anytime we list our properties, we always make sure we're working with the top agents that are the most skilled negotiators are going to get you the most money for your house, not the ones that are going to get eaten alive by the wolves on the other side and are going to discount your property and convince you to sell it lower. They're going to convince the buyer to pay more. Mm -hmm. That's so good. What's your biggest takeaway from all of that? everything uh i mean even as a uh, as a realtor myself like i could totally if i want to list a property that's that's how you get someone to list it with you for sure what's up guys this is chris closes your deal and i'm here from real estate investing made easy and lazarus property group and i'm here with uh Nayeli, and we're talking about a potential deal that she has on the table and so if you guys are looking to get help with structuring deals, underwriting, closing dispositions, definitely click the link below in the description and our team can help you out with all of those things. And of course, you can gain access to our weekly mastermind with the link in the description as well. So let's jump into it. So Nayeli, uh, welcome. Thank you. That was a great introduction, by the way. Very fluent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've only done it a few times. <laughs> of course you have. Yeah, so tell me about the, the deal, right? It's in Charlotte. It is in Charlotte, Concord, and it's a kind of pretty simple, I would say, but I'm a newbie, so I, I love that you're doing this and I'm very appreciative, so thank you. No worries, no worries, happy to help. It's currently not listed, but it is turnkey and she is considering listing it and she has a broker that she's considering using to list it, correct? Correct. How did you find the deal? Cold calling my VA. Oh, okay. Perfect. Cold calling off market. What kind of like, what kind of list are you targeting? Like high equity, low equity? Uh, I use them all. So I just sent him a huge list. Um, I'm looking always for vacant, out of state, up with foreclosures, um, expired listings. That's pretty much it. And then he just puts them all in one list, skip trace them and starts calling. So I don't know exactly where, you know, which one of them came okay. from. And is this owner occupied or tenant occupied? Owner occupied. Owner occupied. Okay, cool. Just out of curiosity, why is she selling? She wants to move to a, a bigger place in the area. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the price she's looking for and, you know, kind of where you left off with her. Okay, great. So it was a great conversation. She was very open, uh, great report. Um, she said her broker recommended to a uh, marketing uh, for 320 Okay. And she was just, you know, she said she was very open to it, but she kind of wants to just sell it and just throw it out there if she gets any different offers. So I asked her what would be her minimum, and she said 300000 The property's in great condition. It's turnkey. I think she only needs like an upgrade in one of the bathrooms and paint in one of the bedrooms. But other than that, it looks great. Okay, got it. And when you underwrote it, what did you think it was worth? So because it's turnkey, that's kind of where I'm struggling. She didn't want to be low, uh, low ball for like, you know, very low offers. So which I know in, in a turnkey, you know, it's hard to do that. So I, I'm wondering, I know as an investor, when a property is uh, distressed, I guess the word, uh, you go for like 70, you know, 65, 70%. You know, but in this case, I was thinking maybe, I don't know, 80 to 90. Okay. And then what would be your desired exit strategy? That's a very good question. So right now I'm not great as I'm new. I'm not great at creative finance yet. I'm able to just kind of like go through the very general terms of it. Like just see if she's even willing to, to be open to that idea. Anything on it or is, does she own it outright? She does. She has a balance of 135. Okay. All right. Got it. So 135, she wants to list it for 320. So what, what was going to be your exit strategy then? So I would just wholesale it. I, I did try to offer some terms and I said that that's really not my department. I would have someone with more experience explain that to her, but she's like, no, 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 no. So I kind of went with the whole, you know, paces, truck, you know, analogy. And uh, she was like, yeah, well, you know, uh, that sounds great. But because I do need a down payment to buy the, the bigger place, that wouldn't work out for me. So I was like, okay, I understand. So I was just thinking about, you know, with my experience as it is, and I'm JVing with someone in Charlotte, one of my friends, uh, partners. And so just maybe wholesaling, but I don't know yet what would be my MAO. And 
my exact exit strategy. So, okay. All right. Got it. So just to kind of summarize, she's prepared to go on market. She's got about $135,000, $140,000 mortgage balance. Her broker recommended go on market at 320. She said the lowest that she would take is 300. And then you kind of explain to her, well, after commissions and everything, you're going to walk away with like 285. You know, terms won't work because she needs a, a significant amount for a down payment. Do you know what the purchase price of the property she's looking to buy is going to be? No, I didn't get that far because I got really interested in her answer when I went over that. I was trying to anchor her with one number. So when I did the difference between a cash offer and my question was like, what would you be willing to walk away with? Yeah. And she's like, well, you know, 300,000. I'm like, okay, well, but if you sell your property on the market, you wouldn't even ge be getting that because with all the commissions and the, you know, the closing costs and all that stuff, you're down to 285. So if I showed up at your door and offer you cash on hand, what would be the minimum? And she's like, well, that's a good question. I guess I wouldn't go less than 260. So I kind of anchor her in that 285 that she would get, you know, if she went on market. So I said, but you know, if I give you a cash offer, you wouldn't have to deal with that. You wouldn't have to paint it. You wouldn't have to redo the bathroom. So what would you take? And then that's when she said 260. I'm like, okay. Okay. All right. And what do you think when you ran comps, what do you think the ARV on it is? I see it like a 310. Got it. Okay. So her, so, so then her broker is going to overlist it at 320 you know, hoping that he'll be able to get that. So what's your biggest question that you have that I can help you with? Well, first of all, uh, learning from you. I mean, I think that's why we're all here. And so thank you again. So I guess my, my, the help would be because I'm not used to dealing with turnkey. Usually the ones that uh, get turnkey because I'm licensed in California and my uh, partner in Charlotte is also licensed. When it's turnkey, I basically go for like all listed for you. Yeah. You know, in this case, that wouldn't work because she already has has the broker. So I honestly don't know what would be the answer for that. That's kind of what we're, right. you know, I would need some help. How does she know this broker? Uh, she just said she was like someone that she knew for a while. I'm going to back it up to like more in the beginning of, of the interaction with the seller, um, because I think, you know, some of these things are not going to help you on this particular transaction, but it'll help you in future transactions that you get into and conversations that you have so that you can start to tee it up and at least kind of the way I look at it, right? It, have you ever played like one of those video games where you're like, where you walk around with the character and you're, it's like in a dark room, but you might have a flashlight and the flashlight only allows you to see like so far, so you can't see much further. I haven't played those, but that sounds fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So like you're looking over and you got the character, they're in a room and like, you know, you get the character, but you can only see like a few inches in front of them. They can't see much further because the flashlight only goes so far. Right. So like, that's kind of the, the view that I have of like when we're talking to sellers or, or agents, right? Like we have a limited range of view to what's happening and we can increase that depth of view with the right types of questions, right? By gathering more information, then all of a sudden, now we can see 10, 15, 20, 30 feet in front of us, right? So now it gives us this map and we're like, okay, well, you know, it's like, like a rat maze, right? Where they're trying to get to the cheese. If they can only see two inches in front of them, they're not gonna see, oh, well, that's a dead end and that's a dead end, right? But if they can see the whole thing from a bird's eye view, they're gonna know they have to go this way, turn left, then go here, right? So that's kind of, you know, through the right types of questioning and layering the questions appropriately, you can kind of see that that greater map and understand where you're going to run into roadblocks and where you're going to find the path of least resistance. Right. So when I'm talking to a seller who is already considering listing the property, I'm throwing creative out the window. Right. Creative is so subject to is for pain seller finances for gain. If there's no pain, then subject to is almost never going to be an option that somebody will will take. Could they? Yes, but it's very unlikely because there's a lot of questions about it, right? Seller finance, generally the benefit to seller finance is you're going to get a higher number, right? But it's over time, right? So, um, so people that take seller finance deals and sell that way, they're looking at the long-term gain. So now knowing those things and knowing that she's already considering listing it with an agent, you kind of start limiting your options, right? Now that map becomes very narrow and there's only a few directions you're gonna be able to go. So 
once I start having the conversation like, okay, cool. So you're uh, awesome. So you already have a broker. Cool. Like, how did you get hooked up with that broker? Oh, well, you know, like it's my son's best friend, you know, and you know, he, he's the one that sold me this house. Got it. I don't care about that. Right. Like that doesn't matter to me. That doesn't affect like how I'm going to structure the deal. But what it's going to tell me is how I might want to plant seeds about realtors and how realtors like generally suck at their job. Right. Like, you know, if it's like, oh, it's my son. Right. Or my cousin, like who I have this like very long standing relationship and we're best friends. Like, I'm probably not going to be like, yeah, your agent's probably lying to you about like the value that he could sell it for. Mm -hmm. Right. But if it's like, oh, I was just looking on Zillow and I found this random guy. I'm like, oh, okay. Have you talked to him? Like, yeah, once, you know, he seems nice enough. Okay. Got it. So you don't have an existing relationship with him. No, I don't. Oh, okay. Got it. All right. Well, would it shock you to know that, you know, in this market, when a lot of properties, when there's not a lot of inventory and agents are struggling to keep their business going, you know, that agents oftentimes will over exaggerate the value that they could list a house for. Would that, would that be a shock to you? No, that really wouldn't be a shock to, to me. Right. What am I trying to do there? Like, what do you think the goal of that statement is? Deter them to do that and go with you. That's one thing, right? I'm not a listing agent, so they can't list with me. So what else would that, how else would that benefit me? Going for a cash offer for a different solution. Yes, but I'm paying a lower price. Exactly, yeah. right? I'm trying to get them to, I'm trying to limit their expectations, right? Yeah, he said he could list it for 320, but would it shock you to know that most agents are over-exaggerating what they could actually sell it for when they get the listing agreement? Because they have nothing to lose. You sign a listing agreement for six months, And they get six months to go out there and try to get you the best offer. And if they come back with a 300 offer, did they lose anything? No, you lost the $20,000 that you were expecting to get, right? You lost nothing. So I'm just trying to psychologically anchor them to like, hey, that's not a realistic number, right? Well, that's how I'll start in those conversations. And I feel it out. It all depends on like what type of interaction they're giving me, right? If I'm having like a really good rapport conversation, I'll ask these questions. I never want to make a statement that like agents are going to lie to you and give you like hopes and dreams that are not realistic, right? Because if I say it like that, then it's my opinion. But if I ask it in a question, like, would it shock you that, you know, that an agent might do something along these lines? I'm not saying, I'm not making statements. I'm not making hard line statements. I'm just trying to influence, right? Psychologically influence them on the back end and let them come to the conclusion, right? Like, hey, just out of curiosity, do you think when there's not much inventory and nobody's really selling their houses, do you think it's far-fetched to believe that, you know, agents might kind of over-exaggerate what they would list, the, you know, what they think they could sell a property for just to get a listing? Mm -hmm, that's great, that's great. And bring up her situation at all, right? Now, when she gets off the phone with me, she is, it's inevitable. She's gonna be thinking like, I wonder if he's lying to me and like, Am I really going to get 320? Like, I want that question festering in her head. But again, it's going to it's gonna anchor lower. Then I would say, okay, cool. So, you know, let's just play this out. Let's just assume that you do go ahead and you list it, right? I just, you know, like my goal, not every time I work with a client does it end up in a transaction where I'm involved in the deal, right? But my goal ultimately is to help the clients that I'm working with. Let's just play this through, right? So let's say you go ahead and you list it and you list it for 320 and you don't get any offers at 320 and everything's coming in lower than 320. Like what's the what's the lowest offer, you know, from from a buyer on market that you think you would even reasonably entertain? And she's going to be like, well, I might I think I might take like 300. Okay, got it. So you'd be willing to take 300 for an on market offer. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, got it. And obviously, you know about like all the realtor commissions and closing costs and everything, right? So now you get that offer for 300 and then the national average is about 10, 11%. So, you know, realistically, after paying all those closing costs, commissions and everything else, you're probably going to walk away with around like 265. Does that sound about right? And then, right? What did I do? I ain't so because I stayed focused on the listing price, And I know what you were trying to do, right? And what you were trying to do is great, right? You were going off of the two, the 320 and then 10% off of that. And that's how you got to the 284, right? But what I propose is when you're talking to somebody who's considering listing, stay on the listing, future cast the listing. Like, hey, in a perfect world, you list this, gets listed for 320. 
something goes wrong. We find out that they're raising interest rates again and, you know, they're not going to lower them anytime soon. And all you get, you know, is lower than that offers. I mean, what would you even reasonably entertain? Oh, I might entertain 300. Okay, got it. So that's the, okay, perfect. So let's get, say you get 300 after all this, blah, 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 blah. You walk away with 265. I mean, does that sound good to you? Like, would you be happy in that scenario? You're going to walk away smiling and moving on to your new bigger house. And she's like, yeah, that'd be perfect for me. Okay, got it. Perfect. Okay. So let me ask you this in a perfect world where we can avoid you having to go on market and spend 30, 60, 90 days, having people trouncing through your house, picking apart all of your finishes and like complaining about this and having to get a loan and all jumping through all these hoops, right? In a perfect world, if we could get you close to what you would net in a retail scenario, just straight cash and just be done with it. So you can move to your next place and, and start your new life. Like, is there anything that you wouldn't like about that? I mean, the word of that way, it's awesome, yeah. So my focus is I want the objection up front. I want to know why not, right? Most people, when they're negotiating, is they're trying to just go for the yes. But the problem is the objection is going to come up whether if you try to avoid it or not, right? So like get the objection on the front end. I want to get that now because it's a lot easier for me now on the front end after I haven't tried all this negotiation tactics to know what the objection is and then isolate to the objection, right? So let's say, let's say I asked that question. Is there, you know, is there anything that you wouldn't like about that scenario? Well, you know, I might feel like, you know, I just didn't try to get as much as I possibly could for it. Like, okay, yeah, that that's fair. Is there anything else that you wouldn't like about that? I don't, commonly what people do, salespeople do is they get into this whack-a-mole, right? Where an objection happens, and you may have experienced this in the past, um, where somebody says an objection, you go right to that objection, you overcome that objection, and then all of a sudden, there's another objection. Like, what the heck's going on? I just answered your objection, and now you got another objection. Have you ever experienced that? Oh, yeah. That's what we call whack-a-mole objections, right? So, what I propose is that when you pull the objections out of them, whatever they say, like, Okay, got it. So you're saying that you might just have a little bit of a fear of regret for not trying to get the most that you could possibly get for it. Is that what I'm hearing? Am I wrong about that? No, you're not wrong about that. Okay, got it. Is there anything else that you wouldn't like about that type of scenario where you get all cash, close on your timeline, you can move on, you don't have to clean the house out, you don't have to paint the, the bathroom, you don't have to fix any of this stuff and you don't have to worry about loan contingencies and appraisals and all that jazz and you can just move on. Is there anything else that you wouldn't like about that perfect scenario? <laughs> no. Okay, got it. So what I'm hearing is if, if there was a world that we can solve that fear of regret, then you'd be comfortable moving forward with an offer, you know, right around what you would net in a uh, retail scenario. No, you're not wrong about that. And I always, and if you notice, I ask, am I wrong about that? Not, is that right? Here's why. Most salespeople have been trained and conditioned to go for the yes. They want to get people to say yes as much as possible, right? Because they're going to condition them psychologically to say yes. So then when they ask for the sale, they're going to say yes. Problem is, it's 2023. Consumers are super intelligent and people know that tactic. People have a fear of saying no partly because they think that it's a combative situation and they don't feel safe to say no. So what I try to do is I try to create a scenario where they feel perfectly safe to tell me no on the front end, right? And like, they're not gonna get judged for it. It's not gonna be this attack. However, all of the no questions that I'm asking, it's purposely designed to get a no, which really means a yes for me, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if we could resolve X, Y, and Z, you would be comfortable moving forward. Am I wrong about that? Nope, you're not wrong about that. Which is ultimately, yes, I would move forward with your offer if you could do that, totally. right? Totally. So, but I'm trying to keep resistance low. The lower I can keep resistance, right? You know, think of it like like a pipe, right? If I have a, if I have a pipe and I'm turning water on and like it's blocked halfway, well, you know, at least so much water is going to go through. I want that resistance totally down so the water's just blowing, right? I like that. So I'm going to ask those types of questions and kind of lead her to telling me, like, there's no other objection. And if you can handle that objection, I would absolutely feel comfortable moving forward with you. 
okay, got it. That sounds that, that that sounds awesome. So it sounds like really the only thing left for us to do is figure out how we make you feel comfortable, you know, moving forward in that type of scenario, right? So obviously like, hey, look, I totally get it. You know, you your fear of regret that you wouldn't try it out. Let me ask you this, because the reality is the market changes. My my offers, my cash offers change day to day based on the market. So in a perfect world, let's say you decided you wanted to go forward with the listing, you tested the market, and all the offers were coming in lower than you expected. And, you know, and as a matter of fact, there was something, there's a loan contingency or an inspection contingency or an appraisal contingency, and turns out you're only gonna walk away with about 260 on market. Do you think you would feel more, more regret or less regret that you didn't go with our 260, you know, with an offer right in that 265 range? If I like walked away with 260 and you were gonna give me 265, like I'd probably call you back. Like, yeah, but the reality is in 30 to 60, 90 days, the market's probably gonna change and my offer might not still be 265. I, like I don't have unlimited capital. I'm only buying, you know, four more houses this week. I, you know, hopefully yours is one of them. Now she's telling me like a sense of urgency too. In that, like, ah, I gotta make it quickly. Exactly. Yeah. And and I'm getting what I'm trying to do is right. Like she's anchoring regret to not trying to get the best offer. I'm trying to anchor that regret to my offer is the best offer and she's going to regret missing out on the best offer. That's going to allow her to do it fast, clean, no issues, no obstacles. Yeah, that's brilliant. All right. Now, in a scenario like this, like this is a tough type of deal to do, right? Because she can just go list it. And part of the reason you want to find out how tied to that agent they are, right? Like if they have a very personal relationship with the agent, then I'm probably not even going to bother with this, with like this next tactic. But if it's not a super personal relationship, I'm going to bring up like, okay, got it. So, so are you set to move forward with that agent or are you still interviewing others? Mm, I like that. Right. I'm not trying to anchor her to a decision. Like, you know, do you want to go with another agent? Like, are you open to considering and interviewing other agents to make sure you're using the best agent for you and your property? I might even ask like, hey, just out of curiosity, what kind of commission are they are they taking on the uh, on this? Did they tell you? Oh, yeah, he's going to discount his commission down to two percent. Really? Why would he do that? <laughs> now, now, why might that be effective? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Right, because a two percent commission is better for the seller. Well, it's better than not, you know, than nothing, right? It's better than it's, well for the seller if they're going to pay two percent commission versus three percent commission. What's better for the seller? For sure, that two percent commission. But for an agent, it would be oh, maybe. Okay. Right? So I'm going to say something like, oh, "Why would they? Why would they discount their commission for you? Like, did you ask for a discount?" Like, no, he just said he's going to hook me up and give me a better deal. Oh, interesting. Never heard, never heard a top agent do that before. Now I didn't say he's not a top agent. <laughs> I said, I've never heard a top agent do that before. Right now she's thinking like, is he a top agent? <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> I'm not working with a top agent. I want to work with a top agent. And then I'm going to say something like, like, Here's the deal. Look, I get it, right? That sounds appealing. And I might be, you know, possibly motivated to go with an agent that's going to discount their commission on the front end as well. But let me just position this for you and, and you know, take this for what it is. This is probably like, do you own a property that's worth more than this house right now? No, this is your primary residence. Okay. So we're talking about your largest asset that you own. Now, if this agent is not even confident in himself enough to tell you why he's worth the full commission, what makes you think that when he's sitting across the table from a top buyer's agent who is extremely skilled at negotiating, what makes you think he's going to get the most value for your house against a shark like that? Now, look, I'm not a big fan of playing with wolves. However, 
if I'm going in, if I'm going to go into battle, I want a wolf on my side. I don't want a sheep on my side. So that's why anytime we list our properties, we always make sure we're working with the top agents that are the most skilled negotiators are going to get you the most money for your house, not the ones that are going to get eaten alive by the wolves on the other side and are going to discount your property and convince you to sell it lower. They're going to convince the buyer to pay more. Mm -hmm. That's so good. What's your biggest takeaway from all of that? everything uh i mean even as a uh, as a realtor myself like i could totally you know if if i want to list a property that's that's how you get someone to list it with you for sure i mean it's like it's like in any law situation you want the best lawyer advocating for you right uh so it's, it's the same it's your biggest asset i mean it's it's your legacy in a way yeah so yeah, i love it and the whole anchoring you know that you talked to about prior i mean that, that was also so great Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, so now that doesn't really help you with like, what price do you go for on this and, and all that, but at least, you know, moving forward, when you're having these conversations, you can start anchoring in different ways and start pulling, pulling the threads, right? Think it's a giant sweater and you're just pulling on threads. Like, is this thread going to come undone? Is this thread going to come undone? You're just trying to figure out where the holes are that you can start going down. That'll help you there with regards to this property. I would say, you know, if you can get it, 260 or if you can get her to commit she said 260 265 is the lowest that she would take what how did you leave it off with her what was the like what does she think the next step is that's going to happen so i said you know well i kind of have almost all the information that i need um i'm gonna have my underwriter uh run all the numbers your number doesn't scare me but uh, you know i have to talk to my, my partners about it um i'll give you a call monday and we went through that monday morning morning afternoon you know, okay, Monday afternoon. So that's it. So I have to call her back on Monday at one. Got it. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, cool. So what I would probably recommend is when you get on the phone with her, I would, you know, obviously do your rapport building, you know, reconnect with her, right? How's your weekend? All that jazz, you know, stuff you would do. Um, and then I would be, you know, asking her you know i would reaffirm everything that you've already gone through right like you know because a lot of times and not saying you would do this but a lot of times people i talk to they do all they they do a lot of good work on the front end negotiating them down to find out what their number would be and then when they call back three days later they just go right with their offer they don't re get the recommitment right so I would basically go through like, hey, so, you know, we talked to the team and everything. Now, chances are you're not going to be able to wholesale this. So um, you will have you would have to find like a rental buyer. Would it, like, is it a good rental area? Yeah, it's uh, like an opportunity zone. But yeah, I would love to talk about that. Also, the strategy. Okay. You know? Yeah, the exit strategy might be a little difficult for like a wholesale. I mean, you could try to find a wholesale end buyer. Um, it might make more sense as a novation, quite honestly, um, is what I'm thinking, because if you could list it, so if, if you were able to get it for 260 divided by 0.9 and then minus 310, that's a 21. So if you could novate it and list it at 310 and get it sold for 310, then you'd make 20 grand on the deal. So tell me about that. Like if, if I know that in a way I would put it, be putting in the market, right? Nope. As a matter of fact, you can even make more because your partner's an agent out there. So then your eight, your partner would list it. So you would only be paying. So instead of, so basically what we do is we take whatever the sell price is, 310, right? Mm -hmm. Times 0.9 and then minus the buy price of 260. So it'd be $19,000. But for you, if you're friend is going to list it, then you get rid of 3%. So now you're doing 7%. So you go 310 times 0.93 minus uh, 260. And now you and your friend are split in 28 grand. Okay. Right. That's lovely. <laughs> now, the way that you do this is, you know, you say, hey, so what, what I would do is I would basically say, 
she's expecting a cash offer. So I would almost just go in and be like, hey, so, you know, talk to my team, whatever, like obviously re get her commitment on all those things based on our conversation. You know, like I, I chatted with the team and, you know, still waiting to hear back, you know, from last partner. Um, but, you know, things seem like they're moving in the right direction. I just want to confirm with you based on our conversation last week. So as we spoke, you know, you mentioned that, you know, for, you know, a quicker, you know, a cleaner transaction, you know, that would get you exactly what you want. You can move on to your next place and you don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops and everything. Um, you'd feel comfortable with a number uh, right about 260. Am I wrong about that? Nope, you're not wrong about that. Okay, awesome. So I've got some great news for you. Um, what we're able to do now, not all of these get approved, like one out of 30 of these get approved. Like, you know, we, we certainly buy cash, but we also have another program, um, that almost never gets approved. But in this scenario, I was basically able to get full approval and it's our concierge service. It's just like the cash offer, right? So you're going to walk away with 260. And then of course you've got your, your mortgage and everything, but you're going to walk away with 260. And what's going to happen is we're going to come in. We're going to make sure that we get everything cleaned up, you know, make sure it's all good to go. And we have our partner network of investors because, you know, sometimes we buy for Airbnb. Sometimes we buy for, you know, assisted living, like all different types of scenarios. So we have a whole bunch of partners that are going to come in. One of them is going to figure out what they're going to do with the property. Um, so we're just going to bring it out to them and, you know, blah, 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 right. Go through the process. You're going to get your 260. Essentially, you're just telling them that, hey, I'm guaranteeing your number, 260. I'm getting everything else on top of that, right? So I'm going to market it out to my partners and one of them is going to take it over. So I might not be the actual end buyer on this, um, but I'm going to partner with somebody that's going to figure out the best way to use this property. Okay, and that's great. What about, because I think innovations and maybe, you know, that would be helpful for everybody. But novations typically end up being listed on the market, no? So how, when she finds out that you listed it for a higher price, wouldn't she, what's the objection? What, wouldn't she come back and be like, what's up? You know, I could have listed it myself. I yeah. already had the mark, like it was ready to go with the broker. Blah, yeah, blah, blah. so you're going to yeah. tell her, you're going to tell her that you're going to do that. So you're going to say, hey, look, we're going to, we have a big network of partners and investors most of the time one of the people in our network of partners is just going to take it on. Sometimes it's it's through end buyers, right? Um, and so sometimes that involves us putting it on the MLS just so we have pictures available and people can see what it is. It just gives us the ability to market it out there to that group of investors a lot easier. But the thing that you're not going to have to deal with is all these walkthroughs, showings and everything. We're just going to do a couple and we'll handle all of that. It's a white glove service. So we'll take care of everything from start to finish. Um, you won't have to deal with a bunch of hoopla. You don't have to like clean the place out. You're not gonna have to paint walls. You're not gonna have to do this. We're gonna take all of that on. So none of that cost to do those things is gonna come out of your pocket. Okay. But if she says one of the things that I, and this is an objection that I am just thinking that she might say, well, one of the, th if somebody sees it on the market and they come to my house, that wouldn't that be the same as me? You know, I still have to deal with them coming into my house, kind of being picky about my pictures. And so here's here's the thing: we only do two to maybe three times where we're gonna come out, right? So you're not gonna. First off, if anybody ever comes and knocks on your door and says, "Hey, I saw that the property is for sale," turn them away. Tell them to reach out to us. We handle it. We're never going to send somebody there unannounced. So you're always going to know what's going on. One big thing about us is communication. So we're always going to overly communicate what's going on. And we're just going to set one or two times where we're going to come out with a few of the partners that want to see the property and walk it and just confirm everything. And then we're going to take it to close. Okay. What other the questions do people typically ask that I'm not asking for innovations? Mm. Like any objections that a seller might have regarding innovation? Because it does sound wonderful. Yeah, that's really the biggest one is like, well, why can't I just sell it myself and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, hey, look, the reality is you can sell it yourself. 
The difference is, do you want a done with you or a done for you, right? Do you want to have to set aside your Saturday to go to Home Depot and pick up cans of paint and like touch up these places? Or do you want to like hire somebody to go and do those things and have to shell out that money and then deal with the contractor that doesn't show up? you know, to, to paint those things. Like what are all the hoops that you want to jump through? Like if you're fine with jumping through all those hoops, like go do that. Like, I'll push them that way. Like if you're cool with jumping through all those hoops, you know, hiring the, hiring the painter, doing this, like, oh, well the agent said he could do that. Like the, the same agent that discounted his commission 2%, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, what's in it for him? There's no motivation. I mean, I don't know. We do this all day long. Like all we do is manage contractors. So like, I don't have to find a contractor and I'm not hiring a contractor. I'm using one of my contractors to come out and do the work for me that they do on every other property that we do. This is what we do. This is what we're skilled at. This is what we're best at. And again, you know, it's a concierge white glove service. We're going to hold your hand the whole way through. We're going to take everything off of your plate so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Wow. Now it's harder to do this, like on a deal where they're already, you know, talking to an agent, like, let's be real. So, you know, but I think from an exit strategy standpoint, I think, could you wholesale this deal? Yes, you could, but your buyer pool is limited and it's not quite as easy to find rental buyers that are buying the traditional way. And rental buyers that are buying the traditional way are not buying as much right now because interest rates are so high. So it's a harder deal to wholesale when it's turnkey like that. Um, if you add it creative, then you know that would obviously be great. But you know you can't always get them creative. Another option you could do mm -hmm. is you could do what we refer to as the best of both worlds option. What's that? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> So the best of both worlds option is perfect for the seller who might just regret a little bit not taking the chance to get the most that they could possibly get for the property. So what we do in that scenario, and your agent would never offer this because they don't buy cash, right? But we do. And we have agents that we partner with there. As a matter of fact, one of my partners is an agent out there. And so what we do in that scenario is we move forward with the cash offer at the 260. Simultaneously, we're gonna go ahead and list your property on the open market. Now, what'll happen is we'll put it out there. I would say realistically being, you know, totally transparent, I probably wouldn't list your house for more than 310 at best, right? Again, I'm anchoring against that other agent who's like, I think I can get it for 320, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we wanna get as many eyes as possible on this and hopefully bid it up, not have very little eyes on it and have to reduce price and and have people asking why are they reducing price right so i would probably come in 305 310 we'll list it and we'll do that for 30 days in that 30 day time frame what will happen is offers will come in we'll compare those offers to our cash offer and what you're going to net and if your net profit if your net money turns out to be more than our cash offer then we close with that buyer but if those offers are coming in and you're going to net less than what our cash offer is, then our agent who we partner with, they're going to rip up their listing agreement and they're going to allow you to move forward with our cash offer at the 260. Oh, I never heard of that. That is great. That's the patented real estate investing made easy, best of both worlds option. <laughs> I love that because I have another one that is similar. So that's something that, you know, might also work. But keep in mind, right, like in that scenario, now if it does go the listing route, then you're only getting the commission. So like you just have to be good with that. And so, you know, what I would say is like, if you can learn the novations at a really high level, I mean, if you want to learn novations at a really, really high level, Pace does some novations. He does them a little bit different. His focus for novations is fix and flips. Um, but if you have properties like this that are turnkey, um, I would highly recommend a guy by the name of Novation King. Um, if And we have a link where if you sign up for his course, I think it's like, it's less than a thousand dollars, but you'll get 15% off if you use our promo code. 
crush his novations and he'll JV with you and like he does really, really well. Um, I would highly recommend going through his course. It's freaking awesome. It's way better than everything I just told you there on the novation side of things. Okay. Yeah, we love that for sure. For any of those of you who are watching, I'll put the link in the promo code in the description below. It's always better if you start out on that course as opposed to like circling back to it. So to recap while you do that, you mentioned that uh, sub two only works for someone that is deeply in pain. Not and only, but generally speaking, you're going to have a harder time with somebody that doesn't have a pain point. Or that maybe has under that seller finance. Seller finance would be for someone that wants to make more money on their property. Like they don't necessarily have pain, right? Because they hold the cards in that scenario. They have an option. Now, if you can get it 0%, then, you know, you're a good negotiator. But, you know, generally speaking, somebody that knows what they're doing on the other side of the table, you know, they're going to negotiate an interest rate in there, which means they're making more money on the property over time. They're becoming the bank, right? Um, so a lot of times tired landlords will do uh, seller finance deals, that type of stuff. Yep, the promo code is REI made easy and that gets you 15% off. So perfect. So last question that I'm probably gonna work for everybody else and everybody wants to know, you JV with any other investors out there? Anybody, yes. Yeah. So we will, well, not anybody, but for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, so we will JV in technically three different ways. So we can help with closing transactions. Um, so if somebody has a lead and they're like, ah, I'm just not really that great at closing, I need help negotiating, we can help with that. Um, if you have a deal that you're looking to wholesale and you just need it dispoed, we can help with that anywhere in the country. Uh, and then if somebody needs help with both of those things, they have a lead and they're like, okay, I need help getting under contract, but I also don't have anybody to, to sell it to we can help do both of those as well. So, um, so I'll, I'm going to put the links in the uh, description of this video for that, but I can also send those links directly to you. Well, thank you so much for everything. This was incredible. Awesome. Yay. Glad you got value out of it. And, um, yeah, definitely let me know if you need help with anything in the future, you know, happy to help out anyway. Uh yeah, so grateful again. I mean, it was an amazing explanation. I'm, I'm sure everybody, especially me, got a lot out of it. So really, really appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Naeli, and have a great week and we'll talk soon. For sure. All right. Yeah. All right.